there is so much to learn from simply immersing yourself in and connecting with the land. Building a relationship with the environment allows us to see it beyond being a resource for our consumption, where we can be more intentional with our actions and the way we move through spaces. Today, we're so happy to share this space and learn more with Lori Snyder, a Métis herbalist and educator who shares her knowledge on the land, plants, foods, and medicine through the lens of her indigenous roots. My name is Lori Snyder and I am a Métis indigenous herbalist and educator. I was uh, born up on the lands of the Squamish people up in Squamish at the base of the chief back in the 1960s. And it was my uh, next door neighbor who was from Ireland who introduced me. So that beginning introduction, that beginning imprint of really falling deeply in love with, with nature. The other piece that I, I always find is really important is, you know, to start asking the questions about who are we and what are our stories as we recognize that we're here on the lands of the, of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam where we're sitting right now doing this filming. And, um, you know, what are their stories? What are their teachings? And how might they actually intersect with our own teachings? So growing up, I, I didn't actually know anything about my Métis history as my mother had chosen to not really talk about that because of the discrimination and the challenges that she had faced and her family had faced. Um, so, you know, as a child, you just do what you do and you run around and you, you know, play. And then when we get a little older, we start to ask those questions. There is um, a deep, you know, DNA, if I could almost uh, describe it that way, that, um, that I, I, you know, this is my home. This is my home and how can I be a, a good guest? Um, I would say, get to know who's growing with you, right? Um, re reconcile with all of those insects, birds, bees, butterflies, and bats. Protect the wild spaces, protect the, the streams, right? Take care of the ocean so that we can ensure um, a future for our children's children. When I turned 50, so I'm 58 now, I asked Creator, um, what's next? What should I do? And um, what showed up was to actually teach. The BC government had changed the curriculum asking for more knowledge to be shared around Indigenous ways of knowing. So it just it was just all of a sudden, you know, synchronicity just had me line up. So I really wanted to really help the children to recognize that what might be happening in the school setting, because it's a linear, might not have made them feel that they actually understood, but it's only because it was the pathway that was being shown to them. And also to let the teachers know that, that they can expand in that teaching. And you know, when you think about it in indigenous cultures, and I'm sure this is probably, you know, worldwide, you would have been watching that child at a young age to see what their gifts were, right? Were they creative? Were they super curious? Did, did they really love to work with their hands? Were they talking all the time? That was me. I talked a lot. So I recognized that was actually building my skill as a storyteller or as a teacher. So um, let's talk about these two beautiful trees that are growing together. If you look at the bark at the base of the tree here, you can see the barks are different. And the one that I'm in, with in my hands is a hemlock. So this is a Western um, hemlock. And you also have mountain hemlocks, which would be up at higher elevations. And then you have a cedar tree, the larger one behind it. And, um, you know, what I find so amazing and beautiful is this gift of this grandmother. This is, this is the one that um, shows up last in the forest. So it's kind of the apex of the forest, so referred to the grandmother. And, you know, I, I was walking it not too long ago, um, out on Musqueam territory, out by what we refer to as UBC, and um, 
I was in a forest of hemlock and the ground is really, really soft under your feet. It's got this movement. And I started really thinking about that. Wow, why is this ground so, so soft here? Well, because of it being the last tree to show up in that evolution of the forest, that means everything else has been giving to that soil for this one to grow. These needles, so you can notice it's quite white underneath on the back side. So, you know, looking at identification, of course, is really, really important. They're very small needles. And when the new spring growth happens, they'll be kind of lime green and we can actually uh, make tea. And this has a bit of a sour uh, flavor to it. It's kind of tangy. And that's an indication that it has vitamin C. So good for, you know, keeping our teeth in our body, you know, good for our muscles, good for our heart, uh, good for the collagen. So don't spend your money on collagen cream. You want to have vitamin C to build up your own collagen. And it also gives us energy. So, you know, um, I often think that maybe in a couple years we might not have coffee, right? Like how are, how are things going to be moving in the next, you know, five years? So this will be a really great plant to have growing in our cityscapes so that we can access that new green growth and get our vitamin C. Indigenous knowledge to me is about a relationship and that it's not a one-way relationship, it's a reciprocal relationship. And then just remembering, you know, only taking what we need. So, you know, I love these R's, you know, of respect, reverence, responsibility, relationship, reciprocity. To me, that is um, a, a, a kind of a woven uh, instruction that, uh, that we're reminded of how we walk as the two leggeds. A favorite memory. I think just seeing really the kids responding, uh, how empowered they are. I felt like they were like, oh, Thank goodness, someone finally arrived that can tell me who these plants are because most adults cannot tell you. Even the teachers cannot tell you. Here, here's something I remember. Um, at some of the schools, you might see flowering red currant, which is an important plant for hummingbirds. You know, I know little girls, they love picking flowers to take to their teacher. So I reminded them that, you know, the hummingbird cannot go to the grocery store. And of course, they all laugh. And what are you going to say when you see the other kids picking the flowers? Oh, we're going to tell them no. And I said, well, how about instead of saying no, that we, that we remind them, that we let them know that this is the, the food for the hummingbird. So all of a sudden you see, you, you start to change the way that we even present. It's not about a no, it's about an understanding. And um, I noticed two months after you know, sharing that with them, over 600 students in that school, that the flowers weren't being picked. So I'm like, wow, what kind of ripple effect that can have with 600 children outward in the world, that we start to change that so we're not picking everything that we see and recognizing that something else is getting its food there. Now, we are so grateful to share a chat with Sarah Common and Jim McLeod from Hives for Humanity. Their organization has taken a holistic and community-based teaching approach to learning about nature, bees, and hive culture. Through various workshops, they foster relationships and knowledge sharing with marginalized and at-risk populations in the downtown east side. I'm Sarah Common. I'm one of the co-founders and the current executive director of Hives for Humanity Society. Um, we're a nonprofit. We were founded in 2012 in the downtown east side of Vancouver, and so we work out of out of that community alongside members of that community to create opportunities for connection to nature um, through this like culture of the bees um, that we build around our honeybee hives. Um, so that includes gardening, it includes candle making, and it includes teaching and sharing skills and, and leadership opportunities as well. Yeah, Jim McLeod, um, Hive for Humanity since the start. I uh, largely everything from, from beekeeping, uh, maintaining the boxes, uh, making candles, labeling honey, just whatever's, whatever's needed. 
and uh you don't see a lot of growth from people who are basically as hands-on as you want to be like if you're if you're first time at the garden or whatever and you're watching us if you want to just stand outside the enclosure and just watch us that's fine if you actually want to throw on a veil and get in there and actually handle the frame that's fine it's uh you get to get as involved as you want to be you see a lot of growth from people as they start to go from being outside the, the uh, enclosure to actually getting in there and handling things and so that folks could come in, like as Jim was describing, like they might see our beekeeping suits, they might see the smoke like through the fence at the Hastings Folk Garden on uh, the Hunter Block of Hastings there. Um, they might, I don't know, just see the gate open and be curious. They might see the fig tree and some shade and a bench underneath it. You know, they could come in um, for any reason and they'd be welcomed in um, and they'd be given space to like take the respite of the garden on their, on their own terms connection to nature is how we do that and that's where we find our shared humanity um, our shared connection and where you know like as we step into nature um, some of the like judgments the preconceptions um, the biases um, this like deeply ingrained like societal racism and classism um, these things dissipate when we're in nature, when we have like our hands in the soil, when we're like holding a frame of honeybees, when we're tasting that like honey fresh from the comb, uh, when we're nurturing a plant from seed through to bloom, um, through to seed again, you know, like being part of that whole cycle uh, really connects us in. Um, and, and yeah, Jim was speaking to that a bit. Like people can set their own boundaries. They can participate wherever they're at. Um, for a minute or for hours or for years, for decades in, mm -hmm. in the case of Jim here. Um, you know, we all get to, yeah, it's like you get to step in and all, all of those labels um, can be left behind. And that's actually like one of our, kind of our ground rules really is that we like leave um, outside of the apiary and outside of the garden anything we might be carrying that day, like that we get to put it down and we just get to be in the moment. Um, and that's why we call it therapeutic beekeeping. Um, and that's where we experience like the therapy of the gardens and the bees is in just like being in that moment and, and in connection to nature and through that um, really learning how to see I think ourselves and, and see each other and like I mean like you know truly see um, each other um, and value what each unique person is bringing um, to our garden to our program to our day. Yeah there's a lot lacking in the downtown east side but I think the thing lacking the most is opportunities and it's uh there's a lot of us down here that do actually you know want to do things. Like when I first got down here, I was fresh out of the hospital. I could I could barely walk. Both my arms were in splints. I had um I had I've got two plates in this arm and one plate in this hand and three in my skull and uh, my I had human someone on both knees. I could barely I could barely function and before that I was a workaholic. Like I, I used to work like sixty, seventy hours a week and my first time we were down here in the downtown east side, well, we turned into the downtown east side. I've been in and out of here like many times over the years. But I was actually dealing with depression because I just felt so trapped and useless suddenly. And with the opportunity to, to start getting involved with life skills and start working there and the chance to, to work at the garden and to work at the front desk and to facilitate groups and stuff, it was, it was so important to me. It was, I finally found, you know, <clears throat> sense of value again and you know some some purpose and stuff, and stuff again so it was um it was very important to me to get the opportunity to be able to do something we are seeking to dismantle um like around poverty around the war on drugs around the housing policy crisis that we're in um that we are that we're centering the lived experience um you know of our folks who are experiencing those dynamics to help us in making our program relevant keeping it relevant and working together to, to dismantle those oppressive systems um so yeah the mentorship program is like this this like really big piece um that looks a lot of different ways depend on, depending on like the day and, and who you are and, and how you want to take it it's really important to, to, to give back to this community and to contribute to it and to try to help others to find their place and also in you know, show them that there is opportunities for them also and that they, you know, they can be more than what society thinks they are. And so we're working to have our gardens um, be places that save lives in that way too. Um, and to tell that story, because it's not the one that's told about this community, um, 
like the that true like neighborhood community connection um that's what saves lives you know i'm also a firm believer that you don't necessarily have to keep someone breathing to save their life to save them to maintain quality of life it's just as important to give them back meaning and quality of life because saving a life also in my mind yeah and especially you know through this pandemic i think we've extra seen how so many people have gone to their gardens gone to their kitchens like gone to nature for that well-being and that mental health when there's like all this pressure of you know the isolation that is like necessary for our like communal health right now you know the social distancing um and what a privilege that is actually and i think one of the things that this pandemic ha has revealed is the inequity the like the unequal distribution um of like access to health, of access to nature, public green spaces, um, especially in the heart of the city, are, are really important um, so that folks who are experiencing poverty um, and who have experienced this like oppressive, capitalist, like racist, classist society, like the structure that we're in, that we create access to nature right in the heart of the city, right on the street, so that people can come right into it. and. We're seeing like a lot of pressure on our green spaces. We're seeing the closure of green spaces. And so our little folk garden is one of the only green spaces in the community. But nature is so healing, you know, it, it's so giving and it's healing. And then our call to action is to like give back um, to nature, like give back to this land, um, foster, like create, nurture, protect, steward the green spaces um, in our communities and, and continue to expand them in ways that are inclusive and, that, and give that access to all, uh, not just to some. Interconnected communities are more resilient um, and as we do this work we're doing it collaboratively with like a lot of effort around thinking about inclusion and, um, and celebrating the diversity of our communities. Um, including like all the kinds of bees, all the kinds of medicinal plants and, and all the people. So what I see is lasting relationships. I see like, deep partnerships um, and I see our gardens thriving um, alongside the people that are, that are caring for them. Tackling the environment and all its issues can be quite intimidating and overwhelming to the point where you wonder, what can I as an individual do? Learning directly from the earth helps us reassert our focus on why we try to make sustainable shifts in the first place. It can be the small things like going for a walk and skipping out on headphones to be a little bit more present, joining a local workshop, taking your lunch breaks outside, or learning how to identify local plants and their unique properties. It was such a great experience to have met Lori, Sarah, and Jim, where through their work, they show how important it is to be present in and with nature sharing knowledge through relationships. However, learning from the earth also comes from a place of privilege. Like Sarah touched on, green spaces can often be inaccessible for certain populations. We want to share resources that can not only be utilized depending on accessibility, but also on different learning styles, whether you are a visual, auditory, verbal, or hands-on learner. We all have special contributions to offer. Thanks for watching this week's episode. Next week is the season's final episode, which will be centering around environmental justice. We'll be chatting with Trisha Barbarona from Shades of Sustainability, a community project aiming to mobilize BIPOC youth to reconnect with their culture and reimagine sustainability on their own terms. We will also be talking with Stephanie Allen, the co-founder of Hogan's Alley Society and a housing development specialist at BZ Housing, who is actively working towards racial equality by addressing the problems of gentrification, displacement, and discrimination in Canada today. See you soon!